military mistakes, public surveillance, national security. Can you keep a secret? This week on Click, hero or villain, we chat to one of the web's most divisive figures. What do you get if you cross a taser with a drone? Well, a taser drone, of course. We ask the question, why? We go behind the screens with the advertising tech that's planning to take over the world. And flight delays got you down? We'll show you how to survive that longer than expected airport stay in Webscape. Welcome to Click, I'm Spencer Kelly. Over the last couple of years, we've spent a lot of time talking about one person. Now, this person is one of the most controversial figures in the world, and he helped facilitate one of the biggest security leaks in history. We've never had the chance to talk to him directly or ask him any questions. That is, until now. And that's because this week I've been able to chat over satellite to Julian Assange, founder of the whistleblowing website WikiLeaks. Assange, of course, has been based in the Ecuadorian embassy in London since 2012, following a British court ruling that he should be extradited to Sweden to face questioning over allegations of sexual assault. A former hacker, it was in April 2010 when Assange and WikiLeaks gained global notoriety, releasing footage showing US soldiers shooting dead 18 civilians from a helicopter in Iraq. Millions of other classified documents followed. For his supporters, Assange is an advocate of free speech and an open society, shining a light on the murky activities of governments all around the world. To his detractors, he is a harmful and unpredictable figure, endangering countless lives by exposing sensitive and classified information to the public. Whatever you think of him, his influence on the world of tech is undeniable, inspiring people like Edward Snowden and, for good or bad, changing the very way we view and treat information. Julian, thanks for joining me. You've been in the embassy for nearly two years now. Can I just ask, what, what is life like for you at the moment? What's your state of mind? It's a difficult environment. Others are in a more difficult environment. There is $8 million uh, of admitted um, surveillance of the embassy in the last 18 months. Snowden documents re reveal that the GCHQ uh, has also been spying on our operations in 2012 uh, and the National Security Agency since 2010. Edward Snowden has re revealed then that a lot of our communications, in fact probably most of them, are, are being snooped, are being tapped, are being collected. The people, if you like, that are in the middle are the people who host all that data and run the infrastructure. Do you think that they're at risk? The Edward Snowden revelations demonstrate conclusively uh, something that has been known uh, by word of mouth within the uh, internet services industry for a long time, that the NSA, GCHQ uh, and allied agencies in countries like Sweden uh, have been in the business of targeting um, employees of major hosting companies, uh, the system administrators uh, and so on for uh, computer hacking. It's been suggested that different countries or different continents now set up their own internet. Angela Merkel recently suggested an internet for Europe. Do you think that's really workable and do you think we'd be any better off than, than your opinion of the internet at the moment? I think the impulse to do it is quite important and will lead to good things and should be supported. Uh, the devil is in the detail in terms of how these communication links actually operate. Uh, when you talk about internet for Europe, well, Europe is like a, one of these telecommunications companies. Europe is thoroughly penetrated and thoroughly comprom compromised and engages in dirty deals uh, with the uh, United States government, uh, especially uh, the UK and Sweden. Who should be in charge of deciding what does stay secret for very good reasons and what gets published? Because we can't publish everything, surely. WikiLeaks has a seven-year publishing history. 
uh, and we've never got it wrong. We've never published uh, material in a form which has led to the physical harm of even a single person. Uh, the US government admits that. Uh, any claim otherwise is simply uh, spin. Are you really asking the world to trust you? For any organisation to be accountable, the buck has to stop with someone. Uh, uh, and in publishing organisations, the buck stops with the publisher uh, or the editor. But I wonder if you think it's ever possible to have completely private data in 2014 or whether that's maybe a fantasy. The question is whether a state intelligence alliance, principally the UK and the US, Five Eyes Alliance, can spy upon nearly the entire world at once, on a constant basis, nearly every person, map out the entire community structure of every nation, who influences who, who is connected to who. It's not about making sure that a single person cannot be spied upon, or the communications between two people is always private. Uh, the, the real battle is to make sure that it is hard to intercept everyone at once. Okay, Julian Assange, thank you very much for joining us. You're welcome. Julian Assange. He is a controversial figure. You may feel strongly about some of the things he said. If you do, then please give us your thoughts. Email click at bbc.co.uk or tweet us at BBC Click. And if, like him, you're concerned about the level of surveillance and the threats that that brings with it, this will not be good news. Because, yes, this is a small drone, but it has one minor modification from most other drones. It just so happens to be fitted with a taser. Or to be more accurate, a stun gun capable of delivering 80,000 volts of electricity via a wired dart. The hybrid is the brainchild of Texas design firm Chaotic Moon, who tried out the prototype for click on this very capable dummy. The rather crazy invention is called the Chaotic Unmanned Personal Intercept Drone or Cupid, to give it its more delicate and romantic sounding title. So, why does the world need a taser drone? The reason we did it is because this is the same thing that you see in several of the video games these days, you see it in several sci-fi movies, and so what we wanted to do is take this future concept, make it real, show that it could be built and show that it could work, to raise up the question of technology and humanity and start an open discussion. And what do you do if you've already tased every actual dummy in the office? Well, you get the office intern to <coughs> volunteer. Witness Jackson Sheehan quite literally taking one for the team. We should point out that Jackson was unhurt after being struck by Cupid's taser. And needless to say, kids and adults, please don't try this at home. Yep, and now you know how the boss motivates the click team. OK, next up, a look at this week's tech news. Amazon has launched its own internet-connected TV set-top box. Built to compete against Apple and Google, the device will allow customers to stream content from Amazon's library as well as other on-demand services direct to their televisions. Dubbed Amazon Fire TV, users can also play online games. It's already gone on sale in the US for $99. One of the largest ever Earth observation programs took off this week with the launch of the EU Sentinel satellite. The craft will be followed by a fleet of other satellites which will all return data and measurements on the state of the planet. It's hoped the project will provide information on climate change as well as to help monitor and respond to natural disasters. Let the voice battle commence. Microsoft has unveiled Cortana, its answer to Siri for its Windows Phone handsets. The voice-controlled assistant is named after the AI in the Halo games and uses Microsoft's Bing search engine as well as handset data to make personalised recommendations to carry out tasks. Microsoft has also announced the upcoming Windows 8.1 update will be offered as a free upgrade from the 8th of April.
And finally, forget the millions of pixels on your TV or phone. Meet the Pixel Bots. The 75 strong swarm can create simple coloured images and animations on tabletops and whiteboards. So while we might fear the inevitable robo apocalypse, at least it'll look nice. We think first of vague words that are synonyms for progress and pair them with footage of a high-speed train. Science is doing lots of stuff that may or may not have anything to do with us. In this age of big data, the corporate world is getting ever better at knowing which buttons to press to get reactions from us, particularly when it comes to advertising. Look at all these attractive people. Hear some of them talking and laughing. But the thing is, the more you know the tropes and techniques, and doesn't this generic ad remind you of a certain fruit-based tech company, the more of a turn-off advertising can be. Innovation, honesty and advancement are all words we choose from a list. Almost as boring as waiting for a bus, as LJ Rich has been finding out. This isn't the inevitable robot uprising. Instead, you're looking at something that's been part of an elaborate advertising campaign. What's happening here is you're mixing video from a camera on the back of this part of the bus stop with some pre-prepared special effects. Get the perspective and the lighting right, and you've got an ad that got 4.7 million views on YouTube in less than a week. Now, for this to work properly, everything the camera sees has to line up directly with this grid. Exact measurements are important because the graphic designers need to know exactly where to put their visuals. The installation itself, though, is quite simple. Along with the camera, there's a 65-inch Full HD screen inside the shelter. That's connected to a single computer running Windows 7. In fact, all the hard calculations for the scenarios have been done in advance, and that took around three months. We've taken some, um, some plate shots of Oxford Street, and we've reversioned that into a 3D world. All of the content that we've created within that space uses the environment specifically for that bus stop. If we were going to roll that out across the 1,500 bus stops around the country, we'd have to go and do that exact same process with all of them. That's where the challenge is, really. <laughs> We worked with Unilever on one of their deodorant brands to make angels appear like they were falling from the skies, landing on the station concourse around users. It was the first time augmented reality had been seen large format. The developers also had to make the videos work in different lighting scenarios, for example nighttime or here, dusk. It's an incredibly painstaking and elaborate process. As consumers get more savvy about brand interaction, ads are going to get more sophisticated. After all, sharing engaging and interesting videos with others is fuel for our social status updating habit. And if the content is sponsored or not, that seems to come second to whether it's actually any good. On second thoughts, I might uh, walk. need to promote a product, a service, or a thing, then you need to advertise. It's delicious. Quicker, longer lasting relief. It's the most modern shampoo in the world. Here at the Museum of Brands, Packaging and Advertising, visitors are surrounded by products and commercials from a time when social networking meant attending a debutante's ball. Advertisers are finding it increasingly difficult to attract the attentions of audiences. More and more TV viewers are watching on-demand streaming services or enjoying TV box sets in great big ad-free gulps. And there are, of course, the ever-present distractions provided by the internet. So, as more and more TV viewers' eyeballs avoid advertisements, modern-day madmen are devising new ways to make products seem desirable. 
While the practice of subtle product placement in TV shows and movies has gone on for decades, developers at Myriad have, using technology originally designed for Hollywood blockbusters, given advertisers the ability to change a brand name or, in some cases, an entire product that appears in a program or movie after it's been filmed and edited. One of the great benefits about what we do is we can take a show that's produced, for example, in a US studio um, that gets distributed to as many as two, 200 different markets different brands can be placed into you know, the show as it airs in each of those different 200 markets. So um, a good example of that for, is, uh, is in Brazil, where we, uh, we placed a Mitsubishi in place of a, of a Bentley in one scene. Some people say it should be the other way around. But actually, we placed the Mitsubishi, which was specifically being launched in Brazil at the time where this particular show was airing. In order to add an object to a scene after it's been filmed, you first need to understand how the camera has moved in 3D space. Our brains are very good at this, but to a computer, a video on its own is a flat and meaningless collection of colours. The techniques pioneered here help computers to automatically understand what's going on in a particular shot, so they know how the camera is moving. Once you know that, you can put the new object in, with exactly the right orientation and lighting. Product placement is an example of a hidden method of persuasion. However, in some quarters, more overt tactics are preferred. Online advertising can be very specific and targeted. Advertisers can track what sites users have searched for and visited, tailoring ads as a result of the data gathered. TV is now starting to imitate what the online world is doing. And I always say imitation you know, is the most sincere form of flattery, so we must be doing something right in the online world, um, because TV is starting to, to go towards making ads more targeted and more personalised. Historically, advertising has always kept pace with the latest advances in technology, whether that's paint or pixels, in order to sell us stuff. And while the method of delivery may change, the message remains the same. We'll be right back. After this word, 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 word. Mark Chislak. Now, if you want to get noticed in the tech world, San Francisco is the place to be. It's teeming with young hopefuls, all vying for interest in their latest inventions. And there are regular events designed to help them show off their wares, whether it be the latest must-have app or a giant surveillance robot. We sent Richard Taylor to the largest such startup gathering to check out the offerings. Technology Dream Seekers Class of 2014. 300 companies with inventions ranging from the wacky to the downright outrageous. This Robocop-esque surveillance bot called the Night Scope might look like R2-D2's little brother, but if anything, he's very much Big Brother, patrolling public spaces to predict and prevent crime. We have 360 degree cameras for surveillance. We have radiation, chemical, biological sensor detectors, airborne pathogens that can monitor the weather. Uh, we also have uh, number plate recognition, license plate recognition, uh, facial recognition, and also gestural recognition. So if somebody's waving their hands or maybe somebody's laying on the ground where they shouldn't be, those are things that can pick up on and send cues and say, hey, you know what, we need to alert somebody of this. Other surveillance hardware on show was more cuddly, like this remote camera-equipped dog feeder. Perhaps more useful, a new twist on teleconferencing, giving participants more control over their remote proceedings. The inventions on the show floor, for the most part, a microcosm of the tech world at large, from 3D printed wood to virtual currency scratch cards. If you want to go into a retail setting today and buy bitcoins, there's pretty much nowhere where you can go. Our product allows you to go buy bitcoins from a brick and mortar store, like a cupcake, a liquor store, a, a discount store, be able to get a card and be able to then go redeem that for bitcoins online. But for the most part, the watchword was mobile. Many apps reflecting wider trends from sharing your possessions to personal health tech. This letting doctors and patients use their smartphones to screen for skin cancer, uploading pictures of possible lesions to specialists. These days, San Francisco really is startup central, and those who'd made the trek to the West Coast were in little doubt it was worth it. Richard Taylor in San Francisco. I don't know, first drones fitted with tasers, now giant surveillance robots. Surely someone's going to start complaining about all this soon. Anyway. 
Technology may be watching us, but we're pretty good at keeping an eye on it too. Well, Kate Russell is at least. Here comes Webscape. We built this city. If you travel a lot, you've probably spent more than your fair share of time wandering around airports hopelessly lost. From travel portal TripAdvisor, Gate Guru is a stress-busting travel companion that shows the way to all the features and amenities in thousands of airports around the world. If you connect it with your TripIt account, you'll also get real-time information about your travel itinerary, such as flight times, weather and other important details. Finding your way around a foreign airport can be a nightmare, even if it's just yourself you have to worry about. Add small children to that equation and it's a recipe for stress that could offset any of the benefits of going on holiday in the first place. NCT Baby Change offers parents relief by instantly finding the closest baby changing facilities using GPS. It's mainly focused on the UK right now, but users outside the UK can also add new facilities to grow the database through the power of the crowd. Another great location resource I found recently is Able Road. It helps people with disabilities find the best local businesses so they can enjoy the facilities without worrying whether their needs are catered for. About the freedom road I drive. Whether you're planning a shopping trip, a night out at a restaurant or bar, or looking for a car rental firm that caters to your specific needs, all of the businesses listed in this directory are reviewed and rated by visitors to the site. Those with disabilities, their friends, families and carers, so that you can be confident you know what to expect. Like all good location-based information services, there are free apps for iOS and Android so you can find accessible places whilst you're out and about too. Again, you can help grow the database by adding your own locations and reviews to help fellow users. Wait till you're announced. Video conferencing has really evolved over the past decade, as communications platforms like Skype, Google Hangouts and GoToMeeting compete for our attention. But the one thing all these platforms have in common is the need to register for the service and often download a piece of software. Appear In is rebooting the genre with a free browser-based video conferencing tool that is so easy to use it almost hurts. Because this platform uses a new technology based on HTML5, there are no browser plugins like Flash or Silverlight to install. Unlike Google Hangouts, there's no sign up or login required either. You just fire up the website and share a link to invite up to eight people to conference with you. It works in Chrome, Firefox and Opera, and the quality is pretty good. In fact, I found the video was much smoother than on Skype, which has a tendency to stutter when your connection is under stress. As well as sharing video and audio, you can share your screen activity, just like the other popular platforms. Kate Russell's Webscape, and you'll find all of those links at our website, bbc.co.uk slash click, along with a regularly updated feed of the latest tech news too. And if you'd like to comment on anything that you've seen in today's programme, including, of course, our interview with Julian Assange, then tweet us at BBC Click or email us click at bbc.co.uk. That's it for now, though. Thank you very much for watching, and we will see you next time.